for now. So I'll welcome you all to the program tonight. I'm Andrew Gustafson. I'm the curator of interpretation for the Johnson County Museum. This program tonight uh, complements the museum's current special exhibit, Redlined Cities, Suburbs, and Segregation, uh, on display through the end of this Saturday, January 7th. This exhibit takes a deep dive into the long history of redlining, its roots after the Civil War, its expansion as a federal policy during the Great Depression, and failed and successful attempts to deconstruct the system during the civil rights era, as well as the legacies that continue to impact communities across the nation, including here in the Kansas City Metro today. I wanna to let you know tonight as we go along, if you have questions, please throw them in the chat. I'll be watching that. Um, and also uh, our speaker has asked us to have you tell us why you registered. If you're a teacher, if you're interested in this topic, if you're a uh, general interest in history. Um, and if you want more, interest, uh, more uh, information, uh, from her to please indicate that as well, and she'll reach out to you. So over the course of the last year with this exhibition, the Johnson County Museum um, has offered programming and in partnership with almost two dozen other cultural organizations as partners that has gone deep into the historical roots of redlining, residential segregation, suburb building, and the legacies of disinvestment um, on the environment, community, and individual health, as well as the banking and real estate industries. Tonight's program brings us back um, to one of the origin points of redlining as a federal policy, the HOLC residential security maps, popularly referred to as redlining maps. Um, they were made by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal program um, with local help in 239 cities plus um, in uh, cities across the United States in the 1930s. They were discovered, in quotes, um, by Kenneth T. Jackson during his research for his groundbreaking 1985 book, Crabgrass Frontier, the Suburbanization of the United States. Well worth a read if you're interested in the built environment. Um, following his exploration of the Hulk maps, more historians, sociologists, and even more recently scientists have researched and wrestled with the maps to understand them, how they were created, why they were created, the effects of the maps on federal, state, local, and even private policies and actions, and then how the legacies of all of this history has continued to impact communities around the nation today. And our speaker tonight will dive into some of that history and also show that redlining and the maps that help us visualize that policy are only part of the story. So tonight, we welcome Annie Evans. She's the Director of Education and Outreach for New American History at the University of Richmond. Annie is a National Geographic Society Grosvenor Teacher Fellow, a Nat Geo Certified uh, Educator and Trainer, and Co-Coordinator of the Virginia Geographic Alliance. With over 30 years of classroom and educational leadership experience, Annie designs curricula and facilitates professional learning for K through 16 teachers and museum educators. Tonight, she'll lead us in examining our thinking and teaching practices around our shared contested landscapes, including themes of monuments and memorialization, redlining and fair housing, and migration as we create space for more meaningful examinations of our shared American history. Please welcome Annie Evans. Thank you, Andrew, so much. Uh, I really appreciate everybody taking time out of their evening. I know this week, everybody getting back into the swing of things with the new year. You had lots of things you could do this evening. And the fact that you wanted to spend a little bit of your time uh, with us this evening means a great bit to me and to the folks that I work with here at U of R. Um, the slides are available. I will uh, ask Andrew perhaps to put the link in the chat for us at some point. But this little bitly, if you type this in, it will also uh, get you to the slides, particularly if you're an educator, but even if you're not, I've embedded, and I'll kind of show you beneath the curtain, um, I've embedded lots of speaker notes in the slides. So if you uh, want more information, if you want to delve into some of these resources I share tonight, everything I'm sharing on screen is hyperlinked into the slides. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to kind of start with uh, a visual. And if you would like to use the chat, I'd just like you to take a few moments to study this image. This is an image from one of our maps produced by the Digital Scholarship Lab at University of Richmond. And um, this is a technique that we as teachers, those of you who are teachers in the audience will recognize this. It's called See, Think, Wonder. And basically what we ask students to do, and what I would ask you as an audience to do tonight is just to add into the chat, what do you see on the screen? What does it make you think about? And what questions or what does it make you wonder? So just take about a, you know, a few seconds to think about the image and tell me what you're seeing. And then I'll ask Andrew to read some of the responses to me.
and Annie, I'll tell you, some of our um, um, folks on the call tonight are um, folks who've seen the Redlined exhibit and involved in community organizations. We have an author and project director of an online exhibit called Unvarnished, mm. a professor at UMKC it teaches, uh, who teaches and researches in urban history. Big fan of the project and her students uh, use it as well. Well, I would love to hear from all of the above and collaborate if they have any thoughts on that, um, because we are always looking for people who are using these materials uh, and furthering them in the classroom. So that is phenomenal. Has anybody responded to, um, sounds like we have some ringers, so maybe some of the comments <laughs> in the chat are going to look like the advanced class here, but uh, are there any other comments on the image yet, Andrew? We have one at who lives where and why. Mm. I could develop a whole lesson just on that question. Uh, judgment, better slash worse, segregation, a series of words there. Well, if you'll continue to think about the image and add your thoughts, we are going to revisit this image a couple of times this evening. So I wanted to kind of start off here, and I promise we will wind up uh, towards the end kind of in the same space. So I just want to give you a very, very quick overview of new American history, what we are, what we do. Um, so I'm going to come out of presenter mode here because uh, I like to go toggle back and forth between different slides. But um, new American history was founded by our director, Ed Ayers, um, who is a historian of the American South and a public historian. Uh, and he was the U of R president. And when he stepped down from that, he said, you know, I think I would like to do something to kind of focus in on K-12 education. So he created New American History. This is our main website. And as I said, it's it's in the slide. You can get to it later. Uh, and every month we sort of throw up some new content, whether we have new maps that come out. Uh, Ed writes blog posts frequently through our Medium page. We have a podcast uh, archive of Backstory, which is a pod, uh, started as a radio show. It's a podcast Ed used to host with other historians for a number of years. Uh, we have a TV show that was on PBS with um, 10 episodes that are suitable for classroom use. I've seen them used in elementary, middle, high school, and college courses. Uh, and we have learning resources to kind of bring all of the above to life. So we have maps, we have video, we have audio content, um, and we have learning resources. And all of them are free and accessible for teachers, for students, for people that just in general want to learn more about history. We, our only rule is no login, no passwords, and no paywalls. Uh, so we just ask everyone to please use these resources freely and not monetize them. And I'm going to show you how we embed all of these into our thinking um, and our, our learning resources this evening as we explore this topic of, of redlining and mapping inequality. So um, just wanted to make sure that you guys kind of knew where, where to find everything. Um, so I'm going to hop back to the slides now. Uh, so American Panorama is our digital atlas, and we have a number of maps. A lot of people were already familiar with mapping inequality, which is the, uh, the map that we are kind of here to talk about this evening and that the exhibit is based on partially on. But we have actually four maps in a series that I, I kind of think of them as a four-part story arc that we're going to talk about tonight related to redlining. But we have other maps. We have a, a map of foreign-born population that shows migration patterns based on census data. Photogrammer is a fairly new one, um, which is uh, visualizing images from the Great Depression and then showing them uh, through geotagging. We have political maps showing House of uh, Representative elections, every election from 1850 through the uh, most recent uh, elections. And so it, this is a digital atlas, again, free and accessible for anyone to use. And the four maps that we're going to focus on tonight all come out of American Panorama from our digital scholarship lab here at U of R. Uh, the other big piece of it, uh, of new American history is bunk. So if you've never seen bunk before, um, bunk is an interesting platform that Ed created to um, kind of engage people in looking at connections to history. And so every day this homepage is changing. We have students at University of Richmond who curate content for bunk every day. Uh, we're constantly coming newspapers, magazines, professional journals, um, audio and video content, data visualizations, maps. 
anything that's talking about the American past and then relating it to current events. And so there are many teachers now who, instead of using a, a morning newspaper, they are having their students start their morning off on bunk. Uh, and so you can see we've got, you know, all these different squares. When I first met Dr. Ayers, I thought a bunk is a Pinterest board. Um, and we're going to kind of explore this theme of mapping inequality through bunk this evening. Uh, so I just kind of want to make you aware of what some of those pieces were. Um, so I'm going to start off on a story map. Uh, and you have a couple of images here showing uh, population change. And this comes from a story map called Southern Journey. And there are actually three parts to this story map. And the part we're going to kind of focus in tonight is sort of the middle section, part two. Um, and in this, you know, we, we're seeing this emancipation era up through um, the end of the Civil War and beginning of the 1900s. And, you know, if you've ever used a story map before, um, you may be familiar with the way that you scroll through it and the map changes. And I think it's important for students to kind of understand these population shifts when we talk about things like segregated housing and um, how the redlining policies were formed. And so I wanted to make sure that you were all aware of this map and at, at your leisure later on, you can kind of look at some of those patterns and how the populations, people began moving west and then later with the great migration as they began moving north, our urban population centers really started to change. Um, and those are gonna have an impact as we get closer to the New Deal era. So I wanted to make sure everybody was kind of aware of this map um, and we're gonna kind of come back to it a couple of times as well. And again, you've got links to all of these um, in your slide deck. So in talking about Southern Journey and talking about this, um, this population shift as people are moving west and people are moving north, um, I think we oftentimes tend to teach things in isolation to students. And maybe some of us learned about uh, the Great Migration and we never thought about tying it to Jim Crow era or we never thought about tying that to racial segregation and later on the civil rights because we tend to study things as units in school and then we're tested on it. And then unfortunately, most of us tend to forget it until we have the next test that we took as students. And many of us haven't even been in school in a long time. And so it may not be as fresh in your mind. So what we're really trying to do with New American History with things like Bunk and with these maps and visualizing data is to show how everything that's happened in the past is related to everything happening today. And I think what I'm so impressed with what I've seen um, of this exhibit at the Johnson County Museum is how they, they've done very intentionally tied all of that together. And that's what we are trying to do um, this evening and with our efforts. Uh, so when we're looking at things like um, being in the news lately with the Confederate um, monuments coming down, I live here in Virginia. I lived on Monument Avenue. Monument Avenue has been in the news an awful lot the last three years. Um, this is a, a map that you can visit from the Equal Justice Initiative, if you're familiar with that organization. This is a map that shows Confederate iconography um, when monuments were put up and when monuments have come down in the mo more recent years. It kind of shows the proliferation um, around the early 1900s, all the way up through even recent times, even with as many monuments that have been coming down in the last 10 to 15 years, new ones as recently as three or four years ago have been put up and very strategically where they've been put up. Um, so we've had students engage in using in this map, looking uh, not only at how many monuments each state has, this was just a comparison we did with Florida had 57 monuments compared to Richmond, Virginia that had, or with Virginia, the state of Virginia that had over 376 monuments. So um, this is a very useful map and a useful tool. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not what we're here to talk about. But actually it is because tied into these segregated neighborhoods um, was this intentional placement of mo monuments um, and things like uh, sundown towns and racially restrictive covenants. And all of that kind of feeds into the policies that eventually led to the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Um, one of the episodes of the Backstory podcast that I mentioned is talking about Red Summer, which predated Tulsa. Um, there was a lot of information last year on the anniversary of the Tulsa massacre 
Uh, but even before that, we had what was called Red Summer, that where there were just a rash of lynchings across the country. Um, and so this is a, an old historic map showing uh, the record of lynching around that time of the what they called the Red Summer. And then in the Backstory archives, my father is from Corbin, Kentucky, which is a very small town in um, Eastern Kentucky. And when I was digging through the Backstory archive one day looking for something else, I found this episode on sundown towns and they were talking about my dad's hometown. And I contacted my older brothers and sisters and said, you know, did granny ever talk about this? And they, they're a little bit older and um, they, they're like, no, we didn't know anything. So we tried to contact some of the relatives back in Kentucky. They knew nothing about this. They were shocked. So uncovering these hidden stories, getting these things out into the light and talking about them rather than pretending like they didn't happen is, is a big part of what we are trying to do um, with all of the resources and materials that we're creating. And so I think it's important that we make these available um, to you and to schools and to communities. There's a big push now in Corbin. Um, they've done a really great job. They, they've they brought this information out into their community. They've held a, a series of community forums um, and it's now part of their local history curriculum in their local schools. So I, I feel like in that respect, progress is being made. Um, I mentioned Bunk. So in addition to kind of that Pinterest board um, feel, um, we also build what are called exhibits within Bunk. This is one called Monument Wars that specifically addresses content related to monuments, including where monuments were placed and during what different time periods um, that those are available. Uh, this is a, a reader that was called on Monument Avenue. It's a site that talks about the history of Monument Avenue here in Richmond, but it also includes content about monuments in other towns as it relates to this whole topic of um, iconography and the debates that have gone on, not just in Richmond, Virginia, but across the country in recent years. So lots of good reading um, is linked into here, primary source documents that you can use um, this is a description from the Monument Avenue Commission that Dr. Ayers led several years ago. It talks about how the money was raised and when it was raised and, and who raised the money um, to put these monuments up. Um, there's an image here of, of the Robert E. Lee statue before and after um, the protest marches, before it was removed. The statue is no longer on Monument Avenue. I'm sure some of you have followed that story in the news. Um, but again, it is related to this topic because those monuments were used to sell the segregated neighborhoods in Richmond. Mon Monument Avenue at one time was the most exclusive address in Richmond, Virginia. And building a home or, or living on Monument Avenue or in a neighborhood adjacent to Monument Avenue was considered um, the part of the American dream. This idea of home ownership and, and living in an elite neighborhood and a nice place to raise your kids and kind of selling this whole dream and idea. But not every family was eligible to live on Monument Avenue. And so when we start exploring even pre uh, the HOLC maps, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, before the New Deal era, before um, the Great Depression caused the president to say, we, we need to do something, we need to create these maps and we need to look at our lending practices. These neighborhoods were already being segregated and those statues were a very big part of the marketing campaign. This is an article from the Atlantic. It's it's ingested in bunk and I'll show you how that is in a moment um, by a good friend of ours, Kevin Levin. Um, if you don't follow Kevin's work, he's a he's a scholar who's been a great friend to many teachers over the years. Um, and he wrote a brilliant piece. He's a frequent bunk contributor um, talking about this concept of Monument Avenue using the statues as a marketing ploy. Um, this is an excerpt from John Mitchell, who was the editor of the Richmond Planet, which was the African-American newspaper, talking about the day that the Lee statue was uh, put up. And in there, he already is talking about emblems of the lost cause and how, um, as some, some people were cheering, there were others who were already saying the moment it went up that it should never have been put up and it needed to come down. So these debates, uh, almost as soon as the statues were uh, put in place, they were already a call to take them down. And so all of those documents have been digitized um, and are available for you to, to dig into. Um, here's just an excerpt from Kevin's article where it talks about specific language in there that no person of African descent uh, was eligible to purchase 
land or property or homes um, along or adjacent to Monument Avenue. Um, you, those of you who are tuning in locally from there, um, closer to the Johnson County Museum, I did a little research because, you know, I'm a history teacher, and uh, you, you were going through sort of the same thing. This is an image of one of the fountains. Um, uh, Andrew, you might be able to help me out with the name of the fountain. I didn't find a specific name for it. Is there a name for that fountain locally or... It was the J.C. Nichols Fountain. I the believe Nichols, it, doesn't right. ha it doesn't have a name at this point in time, right. I believe. Right, because they took the name off of it, correct? To take the Nichols name in recent years is what I read, that, I thought. That's correct. Right. Um, and so when we were looking at things like the Monument um, Avenue marketing idea, what I did a little digging around, it talks about right there in Johnson County, um, private uh, public organizations were redlining in Kansas City, um, Kansas, that's you're in Missouri, correct? Uh, no, we're in we're in Kansas. You are in Kansas. Okay, so I got the right one. Okay, I was like, wait a minute, did I get the wrong one? Okay, so it talks about um, and and uh, the other thing is a misconception. A lot of people think it was just a black white issue. It definitely was not. Many of the families whose um, neighborhoods were targeted and scored lower were immigrant families. So it wasn't just black families. Jewish families, Italian families, other ethnic groups um, were living in the neighborhoods which were um, on the HOLC maps were coded in red and yellow, which were devalued or considered um, too risky to provide home loans. Um, and so as much as 50% of the area in and around um, this, this part of your, your state. So Andrew, did you have, did anybody have a question or did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, nope, no questions yet. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is these are some of the ads that were used to market, uh, as you saw in the Kevin Levin article. This is Monument Avenue Park, which was a side street adjacent to Monument Avenue. Um, and in it, it talks about, um, you know, that you're just 100 feet away from Monument Avenue on Monument Avenue Park. Uh, and they talk here about the houses are very beautiful and attractive. Uh, and they talk here the property is west of the city. Uh, it's the most rapidly growing area. Many thousands of dollars were spent laying sidewalks, shade trees, graded streets, et cetera. I want you to keep that in mind. A lot of money went to landscaping and making it look very beautiful, okay? But there were restrictions. And the part that I've highlighted down here with the red brackets, no lot can ever be sold or rented in Monument Avenue Park to any person of African descent, period. And we find this pattern of racially restrictive covenants. We find it here in Virginia. You have it there um, in Johnson County. We find it all across. It's not just a Southern thing. It happened in the North. It happened in the West. Um, and so these restrictive covenants carried over for decades, even with the Fair Housing Act um, during the Civil Rights Movement, even with landmark Supreme Court cases like Shelley versus Kramer, um, these racially restrictive covenants continued to be embedded as homes were bought and sold and changed hands. Um, here in Virginia, it wasn't until July 1st of 2020 that we finally passed a law saying you may no longer pass a deed along that has that offensive language in it. You need to rewrite the entire paperwork before that land or home is, is purchased. Uh, and I believe that locally, you also had a similar law passed in the last few years, Andrew, that from what I could tell. I believe I stuck a link in um, one of the slides related to that. So many states are now starting to pass laws, taking these the language of these racially restrictive covenants out of deeds um, and title paperwork. Because even though the Fair Housing Act made it illegal to continue the practice of racially restrictive covenants, Many times the language was left embedded in the in the contracts and then people were asked to initial next to the places where that offensive language was included so that they acknowledged that it could no longer be enforced. But the purpose of these new laws is that no family sitting down to purchase their dream home or their first home should have to initial five and six and sometimes more times within a home purchase contract offensive language like that. These uh, were embedded into the Realtor's Code of Ethics. They were embedded into other property um, language and paperwork. And this 
Shelly versus Kramer case that went to court, I embedded a video that comes from our friends at iCivics that we work very closely with. Um, they have a very short video if you're a teacher on the Shelley versus Kramer Supreme Court case that I mentioned here, where they struck down finally these restrictive covenants in this court case in the 1940s um, because they found them so offensive and then reiterated again with the Fair Housing Act. So we've got lots of primary source documents available to kind of talk about how these restrictive covenants all played into that. Um, this image on the bottom left is from your exhibit, Andrew. I stole that off your website, but I took a few of the restrictive covenant languages similar to what I share with you in Richmond from, um, from other places uh, closer to you where they are um, shall never be sold, resold, conveyed, granted, devised, leased, or rented to occupy in any way by a person not of Caucasian race. No part of said property or any portion can be said for term of 50 years. Some of them had an expiration date. Some of them said forever, right? The Shelley House, I believe, has now been declared a historic landmark, by the way, uh, and you can visit that. So um, this is a pervasive practice that, that lasted well into the 20th century. Um, so which brings us to mapping inequality. So I'm going to come out of the slides again uh, and kind of share... Uh, how this map works. Um, and just so you know, we this is our second edition of the map is what's currently on our website. And there's actually even more um, updates coming hopefully in the new year very soon um, because we have found additional scholarship related to even more cities that had um, similar patterns, maybe not part of the HOLC maps, but there were other maps drawn that weren't part of the federal program known as the Homeowners Loan Corporation. So I'm going to put, um, put Kansas in there. Um, I'm going to put Kansas City, Missouri in there. I realize you guys are in Kansas, but I think that's one that we'll just use as an exemplar. So the idea behind these maps, red was considered the hazardous. They encourage you not to give home loans there. Yellow was what they called uh, declining. This is particularly where high immigrant populations tended to live and some African-Americans. Most of the neighborhoods that were coded red on these um, maps were African-Americans by and large. Blue was what we would probably nowadays call middle class. And then green was considered the best. These were your well-to-do neighborhoods like Monument Avenue would have been back in the day when it first um, those homes were first built. And what we did was we went and got the original paper maps. We digitized this content, uh, made really, really uh, crisp, high-resolution images of the historic maps. But then using modern GIS technologies, we digitized all of the maps. So for every neighborhood on every city that we could locate an HOLC map in the National Archives, you can now drill down and, and get information on how that neighborhood was coded. We have the original primary source documents. The Homeowners Loan Corporation provided a template, and then they sent kind of a SWAT team of realtors, bankers, lenders, mortgage people, out into the field to assess every single neighborhood in the United States that had more than 40,000 people in population. Uh, and most of it was just, you know, get, collecting data like who lived there and how many people lived there and what condition the homes were in. But many of them, not all of them, unfortunately, but many of them had this area where people could just write it, what was called an area description. And to me, that's the most telling part. Um, and gives us the greatest insight into why certain neighborhoods were coded the way they were. Um, and so here's one that I picked um, in the greater Kansas City, Missouri area. And you notice um, down at the end, it talks about the residential district. Uh, it describes the topography a little bit. It talks about it being a working class neighborhood. Um, pretty much all of them work in an industrial area at a couple of um, auto plants. But it talks about at the end um, that Negroes are found in the Blue Valley District. And almost every area description that you find across the country with the red, that is one of the um, factors or details that is included almost 99% of the time. Um, and so we see this pattern of certain neighborhoods being graded red automatically based on the demographics of who lived there, similar to what we see with high immigrant populations in the yellow. 
And so I encourage you, no matter where you're tuning in from tonight, if you're there close to the Johnson County Museum, if you're, you know, in other states, um, to explore the map, the links are in there. If Andrew hasn't put the link to the slideshow yet in the chat, we'll make sure we do that before we log off. Um, but, you know, you can explore these maps. And even if your city or town was not big enough to be included back during the New Deal era when they were creating these maps, um, perhaps this next map that we're going to look at. And again, this map has gotten a lot of attention. It's had museum exhibits. In addition to the one that Johnson County has had uh, for several months, we have an exhibit here in Virginia, in the Virginia Beach area, um, that a professor at one of our universities just developed, very similar on redlining practices in the Hampton Roads area. And I was just there over the holidays giving um, a tour of that exhibit with some teachers and students. So um, this is this map has gotten a lot of attention, but to me, there are other maps that I think you should be aware of, and th those include other cities. Um, so I'm going to start off back in Richmond, where I taught for a number of years, um, because I lived on Monument Avenue, uh, and you can turn, for the cities that were included in the HOLC maps, and were also part of the Federal Urban Renewal Program from the 1950s up through the mid-1960s, so what I think of as kind of part two of the redlining story, um, this is the fan area where I used to live along Monument Avenue. And by the time the New Deal era after the Great Depression came, what used to be would have probably been coded a green neighborhood in its heyday, based on what you saw in that article that we shared with you about Kevin Levin and how they marketed it as the best neighborhood in town. It kind of fell into disrepair because a lot of the families who were wealthy in the 1800s and early 1900s lost their fortunes during the Great Depression or they were older populations, and as their families inherited the property, they sold them and began moving into the outskirts, what you now see as these green areas, into the early beginnings of what we would now think of as the suburbs of Richmond, and they started subletting them into apartments. And so another pattern you see anywhere where maps were coded yellow is rentals became a dirty word. So rather than the American dream of home ownership, if it's a rental, property, it's automatically downgraded because it's not a single family home where one family continues to own it and maintain it. Um, and so we see the red areas. These are where housing projects during urban renewal came in. Um, and around the time that the interstate highway system was being developed and they had to decide where they were going to tear down neighborhoods, you notice another pattern emerge that it was the red and yellow neighborhoods in most cities where those uh, neighborhoods were being torn down. They did not very often go through a little bit of a blue one there, but they usually um, tore down neighborhoods that had high African-American populations or immigrant populations. And that's very close to when we start to see the term homeless pop up and we start seeing large homeless populations in our urban areas because they tore these um, housing projects down, but in many cases, they did not have any affordable housing nearby that was available and so many families got displaced and in not in all cities but in many cities frequently as you can see here on the graph there were more families of color which are represented in the purple than um in the green who were displaced so we're we're seeing this pattern between who was displaced um in a similar way that we did with the coding of who was coded red and yellow on the holc maps versus blue and green um, so that to me is kind of the second chapter of that story. The third map I want to share with you uh, is sort of a where are they now? And this map is a map showing the persistent health effects of living in a formerly redlined neighborhood. Um, and that map is called Not Even Past. So what we've done here is we've taken the original mapping inequality maps that were digitized um, and we have brought them kind of into the modern age and overlaid uh, an extra layer, which is known as the social vulnerability index. So the, the CDC um, has data on persistent health problems and uh, environmental situations that lead to ongoing health situations with people. And that is all tagged in by zip code. And so in this map, we can, um, kind of start to make some of those connections as well. So I'm going to go down here. Um, would Topeka or Wichita be a better fit, Andrew? 
Actually, I think Greater Kansas City, we're included in that Greater original. Kansas City? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let me go to Greater Kansas City again, all right? So if I bring up that map, here's the Greater Kansas City map that we looked at earlier. What you see on the right is kind of a where are they now map, which is if you were to take the same metrics that were used back during the Homeowners Loan Corporation and score that neighborhood today. So I, I don't know these neighborhoods as well as those of you who are local there closer to the Johnson County Museum are. But um, so, for example, this one here would still be probably coded red by today's um, standards, although one little corner of it there, um, it seems like it has kind of moved up into the yellow from from this. I'm going to just kind of scoot around the map a little so you can sort of see how this works. And Annie, um, I'll just point out that Johnson County is in the bottom left of that. Bottom um, left. Okay, good. Yeah, above, Thank you. That's what I need. Above the word Leewood and above the word park. Okay, am I getting close? Yep, all those green areas there. Okay, yep. so the green areas back during the Homeowners Loan Corporation would have been coded yellow. This one here would have been blue. Now it would be considered green. Um, some of these that 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 one was considered yellow before. Um, and then some of them were, were green, have just continued to, to maintain or grown wealth. This one's got an, a slight upgrade from blue to green. So, and then areas here um, that were previously not residential. So these would have been industrial or not developed. Now we can see how some of those areas have filled in and by today's standards would be considered green, which is closer to y'all, Prairie Village area and Overland Park. But in the middle here, what we've got is some of that related health data. So if I click on this, it's going to show me um, the health data. This is going to give you the original um, information that was to the left of the, the mapping and equality maps where I read to you from those hand typed documents. So you've got that original area description and the data from the original map on the top and the bottom, you've got the modern day health. So uh, if you're looking at this neighborhood, which was a red and yellow back then, and it's actually devalued, it's all red by today's standards, the average life expectancy in that neighborhood is 75. Whereas down here um, in the green neighborhood, it would be close to 83 years old. So it's giving you um, health-related data on things like poverty, asthma, cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, kidney disease, mental health issues, um, obesity, which is oftentimes related to lack of nutritional food, living in things like a food desert where you can't walk or easily get to a grocery store. So you tend to get your nutrition from things like the dollar store, a lot of canned goods, a lot of processed food, a lot of fast food. Um, and it's kind of this slippery slope, um, which leads to lots of ongoing health impacts. Um, again, this neighborhood was coded red back then, still coded red. Uh, part of this was industrial, was coded yellow. Um, as we move around the map, and the map's going to change there. So you can see um, how those issues persist today health-wise. The last map I want to share, um, and I'm going to share it through Bunk just so you kind of get an idea how Bunk works. Um, the last map is called the lines that shape our city. So when we went to Bunk, uh, I kind of showed you the Pinterest board view. When you click on anything in Bunk, um, for example, all of our maps, all the maps I share with you tonight, all the maps we have in the Digital Scholarship Lab are embedded in Bunk. What you get on the left is a link either to the original article, or in this case, a digital map. It could be a podcast, it could be a video. And then on the right, the beauty of Bunk is it's gonna show you how that's connected to other topics. And so you can connect by the core idea, the same people, the same place, and in some cases, the same time period. When you hit view connections, you'll see this deck of cards change. And so these tags, you can also click on the tags and you can say, well, what else do you have about St. Louis, Missouri in bunk? A brand new feature we just released right before Thanksgiving um, is looking at what, what articles or what pieces of content are in bunk on a map. And so if you live in the St. Louis area, you can see all of the content. Here's just all of, we have 28 pieces of content somehow related to St. Louis, Missouri, and we've mapped them out. Um, and to me, I love this map because for the kid that's sitting in your seventh grade history class, it says, this town's boring. Nothing ever happens here. Really? So I encourage you to maybe type in the name of where you live and see, do we have anything in bunk? And if you think your town is newsworthy and that it should be included in bunk, if there are history related articles in the news or magazines or scholarly journals that you think would be a good fit for bunk, 
email them to me. I submit them to our editor. He's very picky. He only wants the best of the best. Um, but every once in a while, he does take things that teachers and then I send into him um, and includes it in bunk. But getting kids and getting just general history buffs like some of you interested in how these stories are connected, I think is an exciting way for us to explore history, um, including the, the map. So the last map that um, the lines that shape our cities, this is showing, you see this image that we started with. I told you to revisit it. Um, this image was actually created uh, as a map shape, but it is not an actual place. What we did here was we built a word cloud. If you've never used a word cloud, it's where you dump a bunch of words um, together. And the more times that that word is used, it, it the font size grows. And so what we did is we took every single area description from all of the HOLC map descriptions for every city on that original map, and we dumped it into a word cloud, and these are the results. So these are the words most often used to describe the red, yellow, blue, and green neighborhoods. And if you think back to those restrictive covenants, to the um, Mon Monument Park Avenue description where they were bragging about all the beautiful trees and shade trees and landscaping, what do we see here? We see landscape, shrubbery, trees, shade, right? What do we see in the blue neighborhoods? We see woods and landscaping. We do see sewers, but that's part of living in the burbs. We see plants. But as you start looking at the yellow and the red neighborhood, you start to see things like pavement and manufacturing and industrial and sewers and odors and treeless. And what, as Andrew mentioned, scientists are now looking very carefully at this, what they call urban heat islands. And so this map is exploring the ongoing persistent environmental impact, especially as climate change um, continues to uh, become worsened is we are now seeing uh, the impact of people living in formerly red and yellow neighborhoods um, who are under extreme heat in the summer. And some of those correlations are being made back to those health maps, to things like uh, cancer, to asthma, um, and living next to those interstate highways that I showed you on the urban renewal map, people with um, lung disease and other pollution related diseases. And so having students view the connections, you notice these tags change. And so kids can explore things like the Great Migration, the Homeowners Loan Corporation. We have 43 articles specifically on that. We can map that out. Where are these articles from? We get a good smattering you know, across the country from that. Um, and so it's just an interesting way for us to be able to explore this topic of redlining and the ongoing health and environmental impact. The last thing I did want to show you is um, we, as I mentioned, we create exhibits. So I showed you the one, the monuments. We also have an exhibit on fair housing that we collaborated with folks like Retro Report. If you ever watch the PBS NewsHour, um, Retro Report has short videos where they talk about uh, current events and then also explore them through a historical perspective. And so we collab with them on this exhibit. So what we've done is we've taken content like I just showed you in Bunk and we put it into exhibit um, and then we've grouped it by subtopics like redlining and federal policy. And so when you click on that column, it gives you, and this is really in mind for busy teachers, but really anyone who wants to explore this topic further. Um, so if you specifically want to drill down to the policy issues, here's pieces of content that we have in Bunk that we think speaks to looking at the topic through policy. If you want to look at federal policy, if you want to look at how zoning and local policies, if you want to look at how people profited specifically from or exploited neighborhoods, right? If you want to dig into urban renewal, each of these subtopics, we've sort of grouped some of those articles so you don't have to hunt and look for them. Um, and so students can more easily explore them. So we're just trying to find all these different ways to kind of package this content. If you're an instructor, the other thing that you can do um, with Bunk is you, you and your students can build your own collection. You can click here um, when you and save it to a collection. Students can take notes here or you as an instructor can create an assignment where you type questions in here and you push it out to your students. Um, and once you've got three or four articles in there, then you can send it to your students. You, you put in your email, so I would only recommend this with middle and high school and older students. Um, 
But once you get it, you hit view and edit your collection down here in the bottom right, and you can um, move. I have a few things in there from something else I did earlier today, but you can delete content that doesn't, you know, maybe you decide oh, I don't want to use that one. I had a couple of things in there earlier today. I've had teachers have kids put the articles in the order of what they agree most to least. They put things in chronological order. You can have your students take their own notes or you can put questions in there for their respond to. Um, give it a name, you know, put some directions up here for your students. And then when you hit finalize, it's going to ask for your email. It'll either email you a unique URL that you can then push out to your students. Or if you're a teacher and you didn't want the kids using email, um, you started off as a collection. The descriptions are up here under how does a collection work. Um, and then it gives you a code that your students use to turn in their work. That way they don't have to give up their email address if their parents are concerned about privacy issues. So we try to think of every way that I as a teacher would wanna use this instructionally, or I wish we had had this when I was teaching um, in my own classroom uh, and make all of these available to you to, to explore topics such as redlining and urban renewal um, or heat islands um, or other topics of historical reference. So I'm gonna kind of pause, go back to our slides because we only have a few more minutes um, I, I know I threw a lot at you this evening, but I wanted to make sure um, that I saved time for these last couple of slides. So I showed you that Southern Journey map that showed migration patterns, um, and I wanted to show you the last couple of maps. That book came out um, in November after the pandemic started, but Dr. Ayers had turned the book in in January, and then of course everything shut down in March, and he called his publisher and said, hold the presses. And I giggled. He said, I always wanted to do that. But he literally said, I need to add an extra chapter because these migration patterns or this, the migration of this, this pandemic needs to be included in this story because of the um, urban heat islands and because of the persistent health and environmental impacts of COVID. We know that we saw in the news that um, this disease spread more uh, quickly and killed more people of color and people living in low-income neighborhoods than anywhere else in the United States. So this map up here shows poor health, people living um, without access to good medical care. This one uh, here shows people living below the poverty line. This is the spring COVID. And you notice there's a lot of correlations. People living in poverty or without access to health care are in the dark red or some of the highest rates of COVID in the very early stage of the pandemic. So again, poor health, living below the poverty line. These are primarily Native American reservations, by the way. Beginning of spring 2020 and by the end of the summer in August. So that we, we think we're the first people to publish a print book that had COVID maps in it. We've been told that. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but that's what we were told. Um, but I think that kids that I've shared that map with have really, um, you know, we had some interesting conversations about that and healthcare providers that I've shared that map with, policymakers that we've shared that map with. Um, and I'm hoping that this is going to impact some policy changes as a result of what we've all lived through these last couple of years. So I'm kind of ending with the same image that we started with. Um, this is a neighborhood Jackson Ward, the one that I showed you where the highway went through. There are efforts now to revitalize that neighborhood like many other cities um, across the country. Um, the secretary, Pete Buttigieg, just came to visit uh, Jackson Ward uh, about a year ago in December. There's talk of building a bridge to reconnect this neighborhood. This is the neighborhood that was cut through um, and you know, many families lived on one side and worked on the other, uh, and they were separated from their families or from their uh, livelihoods, and then those homes fell into further disrepair. So um, there are you know, some glimmers of hope. And so I think tying in all of these things, the pandemic and what's happened with the Confederate monuments and the debates about those are all kind of related to the policies and decisions and choices that our leaders made in the past. And then moving forward, what we will choose in the future with our, through our elected officials, through our policymakers, through us as citizens saying enough is enough. We need to try and fix this situation. We made this situation a long time ago. I wasn't personally alive when those decisions were made, but I am a, a taxpayer and I am a, a voter now. And I want to have a, a part in a say in how possibly we can um, look at things like 
general generational wealth and poverty and what can we do to improve the lives of all Americans. And so I think um, these are tools and resources we hope um, you will, will find helpful in your work in that area too. Um, just kind of sharing the last two monuments now standing adjacent, the Arthur Ashe statue, uh, is on Monument Avenue. It's literally the only statue still on Monument Avenue. And then a block away, this is a statue called Rumors of War that is a block away from where the Stonewall Jackson Monument used to be. And those are the only two statues in the vicinity of Monument Avenue today. There's a brilliant film called How the Monuments Came Down that's available on PBS with beautiful learning resources that are linked in the slides if you'd like to share that story. And it ties in everything about redlining, um, and the urban renewal period in the film. This is just a little vocabulary that I include for teachers because teachers are always trying to front load vocabulary with their students. Um, and I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna come out of presenter mode and see if we have questions, Andrew. Thank you so much, Annie. It was so fascinating to see all these things um, and being able to visualize things through those maps. I, I'm somebody who learns through books. I love reading books, and yet it's so powerful to be able to see how history has shaped the world in, that we live in and see how it is continuing to shape the world that we live in. Um, I wanted to ask our um, audience to throw questions you might have for any in the uh, chat so that I can read those off to her as we go. I was not able to put that link um, for your slides in there. I didn't oh, okay. Have... I will do that so now. You'll go ahead and do that. That would be great. I'll look at the chat. I will go ahead and um, share the link. And I'll quickly just say a few announcements before we go back and read through questions. I just wanted to note that um, the redlined exhibit at the Johnson County Museum closes this Saturday, the 7th at 4.30 p.m. That will be the last time that is available to the public. We do, uh, this week we've been offering um, tours to the public with our curators at 10 a.m. And so tomorrow the 5th and Friday the 6th we'll be offering those. They're included in museum admission. It's a great chance to go through and have sort of the through line narrative through that exhibition. We've also uh, published the content of that exhibit as a book that's available in the museum store that was done by popular demand by groups and individuals who've come in and wanted to take that information home with them to process it more deeply. Um, and these resources um, shared with us tonight are, are yet another way to be able to do that. And we'll be announcing more plans soon on how this content and some of the exhibit uh, materials will be uh, living on into the future. Um, we'll also be announcing more programs soon and we'll be sending out uh, surveys to everyone who was on tonight. So uh, be on the lookout for that. I'll note our next exhibit that comes up is called Away From Home, American Indian Boarding School Stories. It's based on an exhibit that was developed by the Heard Museum in Phoenix, and it's traveling through Kansas City's Mid-America Arts Alliance, uh, a nationally traveling exhibit. It explores the history of federal off-reservation boarding schools, Indian boarding schools, like the ones that were established at Haskell in Lawrence, Kansas, nearby us, uh, today known as Haskell Indian Nations University. That exhibit will open February 1st and run for seven weeks through March 17th, uh, March 18th, excuse me, before it moves on. Uh, I have not seen many questions come into the chat yet, so I want to urge that back out. I see Anne ha uh, Annie has shared the link for these slides tonight. We did have one question, it's pretty specific, but were there things related to tree cover and biodiversity or environment? Um, I think yes. referring to bunk maybe specifically. Yes, that, that Lines That Shape Our City is actually a case study of several cities around the country. St. Louis would probably be the closest, um, but I believe, I wanna say Detroit, uh, there's one out in California, I think Fresno. Um, so yes, they have, they drilled down very specifically into environmental science, talking about tree canopies, um, uh, they've gone out and done, you know, the temperature checks consistently over large periods of time to show patterns. So if you're in environmental science, I didn't really share as much the learning resources. So we create learning resources for um, middle school and high school related to all of these maps. And those are housed here um, in our learning resources. Uh, we have AP level ones that actually have had college professors reach out and say, hey, we're using your AP ones in my environmental science course um, for college freshmen, or we're using it in our US survey history course, which, you know, we're delighted. Um, and some people, you know, indicate here that they were instructors and that they're using them. I think it was Christy. So Christy, I would love for you to reach out to me. Um, I would love to know how you're using these maps in your instruction 
Um, some of you are museum educators or involved in uh, the scrubbing activity, you said. There, that reminds me of another film I'm going to plug called Raised, Raised, um, which was made about urban renewal. And Rob Nelson, who made the, um, the, the maps that I share with you tonight as the director of the Digital Scholars Lab, he's interviewed in that film. And our friend Jordy Yeager here in Charlottesville and um, his collaborators made that film. And we did a, a scrubbing activity with our students. I was the social studies coordinator in Charlottesville prior to joining Dr. Ayers in Richmond. And um, we had students going through and transcribing racially restrictive covenants and um, matching those up uh, and then shared that and, and geocoded those and mapped those out. So families in Charlottesville, which were not on the original HOLC maps, but we are on the urban renewal map. And that exercise is something that could be repeated in other communities. Um, and we actually had adults jump in and want to get in on it when their kids came home and were talking about how interesting their history class was for a change. Then we had parent volunteers and community volunteers. We've mapped out the entire city of Charlottesville and now we started on surrounding counties. And it's a really telling thing for kids and parents to look at those, to look at their own, you know, that look up the deed of their own homes um, is quite an eye-opening experience for many of them. So I'd love any of you who are adding those messages in there, like, please email me. Um, my email is on the first slide. Um, and I would really welcome your thoughts on any of these resources. But these resources are all free for classroom teachers, college instructors. I zoom into classes all the time. I can do free PD for you and your colleagues if you're a teacher. I can teach your class. I've taught college courses, high school, all the way down to ele upper elementary. So I teach on Zoom all the time. Um, and I will be in the Kansas City area in July for those of you who are local. Um, and so I'm going to talk to Andrew about uh, stopping by and seeing the museum, even though this wonderful exhibit won't be there any longer. So I just appreciate y'all coming out this evening. If there are any more questions that someone wants to throw in the chat or feel free to email me um, directly. And I promise I will answer every single one. Um, but we are so thankful that museums like the Johnson County Museum are taking these maps and bringing them to life in the local level because that's how we envision them being used all along. Um, and so we're just so grateful for people like Andrew and his colleagues and Mary um, there at the museum who love to partner with us on these types of um, discussions. Well, and thank you right back at you for the work that you do and everyone at American Panorama and Bunk and University of Richmond. Um, these sources are fantastic for us as individuals who are interested in history and also as public um, uh, historians and museum professionals. So uh, I think everybody um, uh, from this presentation has a much better understanding of all the different ways that you can access history, um, see it uh, in maps, see it in storyboards and things. Um, so this was a, a really wonderful presentation and we thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop that recording right now.